a little bit blasé about the word and uh, Father, uh, we pray that you'd forgive us that. Father, when we see how precious it is, when we see how, what it can do for us, Lord God, then I pray, Father, just for a sobriety from the Holy Spirit to come on us. We pray that your Holy Spirit, Father, would connect the spoken word, the Logos, Father, to our spirits. Take, Father, uh, that bread, natural bread, and turning it into living bread, Lord God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today... I think it's just about up. Yeah, that's a little bit out of focus. Is that a little bit out of focus? Okay, that could be me. It's a bit out of focus. When Aidan was talking today about, you know, remembering the past, remembering the present, I have trouble remembering the present at times. I don't know about you. But anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is, is a, a key to approaching God. And in fact, the, probably the first page of my sermon I actually put as my pastor's note today. Uh, and we're living in a, you know, we're living in an age where humility is, does not mark things. Uh, it's not, it doesn't typify our age, but then again, it never has. What's the opposite of humility? Pride. Okay, and, and we're living in a day where, you know, pride is being presented as the most holy thing. And uh, I'm not just talking about that form of pride, but I'm talking about other forms of pride. You know, we are, we are a self-determining generation. We're a generation that wants to, you know, push our way forward and establish ourselves and do right by ourselves. And we work all sorts of crazy hours at times and put ourselves through so much... Uh, pressure and strain at times to achieve lifestyles that sometimes you know God just sits back and says well I'm going to let you do it that's your decision you want to do that but um, you know I do have a better way and God's way is a better way and God can take a few uh, fish and a, a few, couple of you know a kid's school lunch and, uh, well, he probably wasn't going to school. He's out in the desert somewhere. He's probably skipping school. Um, so took this kid's lunch and multiplied it and turned it into this feast for 5,000 people, men. And uh, they probably fed the children. They probably would have gone in first. And, and the woman too. So we're talking about, you know, a massive crowd out there. Jesus can take a little and turn it into a lot. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, with the little that he gives us, or the little that we sometimes receive in life, how many of you have ever gone expecting something large to come to you and it has been so much smaller? Less, yeah, we've all been in that situation, haven't we? Well, God can still take that and uh, can amply supply your needs from just a little. It doesn't mean you have to scrimp and save and pull in the belt. But the key to it is humility, walking in humility before God. So this, what I'm talking about today is more about humility in the spiritual realm. Amen? Uh, because uh, we have an adversary. And uh, so much of our reverses in life, etc., come because of this adversary, the devil, um, gets advantage over us. And he does it by deception. Amen. He can't just walk straight in and beat us into the ground. He can't do that. He can't walk up behind us with a baseball bat, cricket bat, and just go clunk. But what he does, he lures, lures us into things. And, uh, of course, we go willingly. And in, by going willingly, uh, we get caught. We get caught. Uh, and, you know, there are many Christians who live in fear of the devil. Uh, we don't need to do that. In fact, you know, the interesting thing is that the Bible tells us that we can actually make him afraid of us. How's that sound? Does that sound a good deal? We can actually terrify him. We can make him run in terror. Would you like to know how to do that? Some of you already know this. But, you know, sometimes we need to hear it again because you know, there's a lot of things that we know we don't always, uh, you know, we don't always put into practice, do we? You know, sometimes we flick our... How many of us have had medical, some, some form of medical training? 
Okay, but when you see some nasty cut or something, especially if it happens to you, what do you do? You throw your hands up there and freak? Oh, blood? Well, you know, okay, we can be like that in the spiritual realm. You know, when we get hit sometimes, we go, oh, we faint before the Lord, uh, before you know the devil. And God doesn't want us doing that. In fact, He wants us to put the wind up the devil. Um, do you know what the devil really fears in the life of a believer? Is it faith? Is it courage? Is it charisma? Is it a powerful knowledge of, this, uh, of the scriptures so that you can be like Apollos and refute and substantiate anything that you want to say? Well, actually, these things actually are good in themselves and necessary for our Christian walk. But actually what makes the devil tremble is not uh, any of those. What actually makes the devil run from co uh, uh, conflict is when we humble ourselves, when we pursue an attitude of humility and submit to God. Because really that's the only way to God, is through a, a, a humble attitude. Why? Well, humility really, biblical humility, is surrendering of the soul to God. It's submitting ourselves to God in what James 4, 7 says. Um, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Okay, so what does it mean to submit to God? Hey God, I come to you. Well, maybe not. There's a, there's a quietening of your spirit. There is a sitting down. I, I just sense that many people were, had found that place this morning in worship. And that God was... You know, just there with his presence, just over us, covering us, you know, with... To me, in my mind, in my... I don't think... I, I didn't have a vision per se, but I, I, it, it felt like a, just a, a wave, like a waterfall sweeping across people. So... When we get into that place, when we submit to God, and it takes a humility to sit there quietly and to bring our worries, our concerns, our very life to God, then uh, we enter into a place uh, where the devil fears to go, because he knows who's, who he's going to confront in there. And you can flat guarantee that the devil does not want confrontations with God himself. He's not God's equal. Okay. His kingdom is not alternative to the kingdom of heaven. Satan doesn't rule from hell, so to speak. That's just a concoction of fanciful imaginations. He is defeated before the Lord. And not only defeated, he got a good beating. And not only did he get clubbed to the ground big time, but grabbed, Jesus grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and paraded him through the heavenlies. Made a public spectacle of him. Satan thought he had made a public spectacle of Jesus, but there was nothing. <laughs> and dying on a cross is pretty bad, you know, but there was nothing compared to the spectacle that uh, Jesus made of him. Okay, so um, the devil trembles before the meek because in the very areas where he once had access, he finds Jesus now standing. And that's who he does not want to meet. So when we humble ourselves, we allow the Lord, Jesus himself, to come in and stand there. And that's when the devil sees Jesus in us. You know, if he just sees somebody else, us or our flesh or something, then, I mean, he's not going to worry about that. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Uh, okay, so we need to understand the fight, know who we're fighting, know the strategy, and know how to win. Amen? Now, if we go back to the uh, Genesis 3, um, after the fall of man, God said to Satan that he would eat dust. Genesis 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Amen? 
So what's, the, what's God telling the devil back in the garden? You know, when he goes to a restaurant, they bring him a menu card and all it is is dust, 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 dust. That's all, that's all that's on the devil's menu. I might be ex exaggerating a couple of these things, but you bear with me. But you know, in Genesis 3.19, what does God speak to man? It says, for you are dust, and dust you shall return. Okay, this is after man had sinned. So our carnal nature is, in essence, dust. And all that is carnal is dust. So this dust is the substance of what the devil dines on. So therefore, if God is working to overcome and remove our carnal nature, then that part of our carnal nature that we withhold from God becomes dust, becomes devil food. Amen? Now, we all come into this thing with a carnal nature. Amen? You know, our old fallen nature uh, is still active. It is dying, but it still can be active. It can be surprisingly active in some Christians. Uh, but it is, the, the cross is working to, to bring death to that. And so what the Holy Spirit says, look, you know, walk through life and, and, and walk. You're righteous as you walk. God doesn't hold our sin against us. It's, it's gone in Jesus. His righteousness has been imputed to us. Imputed means to be, it's conferred on you as a gift. You haven't earned it. It's just that uh, God's given it to you. Amen. But God is also doing something. He's imparting something to you as you walk on in this life. He's imparting his very own nature to you. You want to be like God? Well, you get it a little bit by little bit. How do you become like another person? You hang around with them. You study them, don't you? Um... And so this is what life is about, hanging around God, studying him, becoming like him, and yielding up that all, that all those deeds of the flesh, that old carnal nature, yielding it up to God. It pops out at times. Amen? So what, what, is it, what do we do when it pops up, when it rears its ugly head? We acknowledge, we recognize it. We don't try to push it under again. Amen. How many of you have ever gone swimming with a dirty great big beach ball and you've tried to hold it under the water? Ever, nobody ever done that? Okay. So not a very adventurous crowd, are we? Uh, yeah, we've all done it. I've seen some of you guys actually try to hold each other under the pool, for <laughs> let alone beach balls. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll pop up, you know, often inconveniently. Who's ever been turned upside down by that in that phenomenon, you know, where it's popped out beside you and you've gone? Okay, only me. All right. So this is what the flesh is like. Amen. We press it down, but that's not how we deal with it. If we just press it down, it goes down, gains more strength and comes back with more fury. And it becomes more embarrassing to deal with than at first. Amen. Okay, so that old fleshly part that we hold from God, the devil just zeroes in on. I mean, go straight for it. He can smell it. So here we're meeting another enemy to our Christian walk other than the devil, and that is the flesh. Now, some of the problems we are facing in this life can't be directly attributed to the devil uh, always. Um, like I've said, that Satan will always target our fleshly or carnal nature. Um, why? Because these things lie within his reach. We need to get these out, outside of his reach, don't we? Outside of the realm of darkness. And as he goes for it, uh, then he undermines our prayer life, our, our word life. He just undermines our, uh, our, neutralizes our walk with God. You know, I've seen many a Christian begin good and go well, and then the old flesh comes up eventually, and because they don't handle it right, uh, suddenly they come under condemnation, they're not feeling too well about things, and uh, you know, then they get a little bit grumpy and a bit irascible and hard to live with. You know, the old flesh starts exerting itself. 
The next thing, you know, the, the next thing is the devil piles onto that. Uh, accusation starts coming out. Unbelief. And before long, you know, we're doubting our very salvation. Doubting the existence of God. And mad at him at the same time. I don't know how you can be mad at God and doubt his existence all in the same time, but I've met people who do that. In fact, I've done it myself on early days. Okay, so it's only our exaggerated sense of self-righteousness that prevents us from looking honestly at ourselves. Amen? Here's a confession. No, I won't do that. We as Christians must know what is in us along with who is in us. Amen? We need to... Uh, Kim's been preaching very well on Christ in us, the hope of glory, the new creation reality. This is all, you know, this is important stuff to know. But, you know, on the other hand, we've got to know what's in us ourselves, what we're capable of. Um, and, of course, we must be aware of the power of our carnal nature. Uh, Jesus was referring to this in uh, John 2, verse 23 to 25. Now, uh, you know, Jesus is going into Jerusalem and during the Passover, the big crowds, and um, he'd been preaching there. This is in the early part of his ministry. He, had, he enjoyed a lot of popularity. And so he goes into Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. Uh, but Jesus, this is the funny, you know, the next line, Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to, to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. And while he was getting heaps of praise and all that sort of thing, Jesus knew something too, that those same very crowds would be screaming for his blood, uh, you know, in a year or so, or a couple of years' time. He knew what was in man. You know, what, what did Jesus know what was in man? Man's susceptibility to the devil, that's what he knew was there. And that the susceptibility was through pride. Now, without going into this a lot of time, because I don't want to sort of hammer the pride thing too much, you know, even some of Jesus' choice disciples betrayed him or, or uh, um, annoyed Jesus enough to turn on him and say, get behind me, Satan. Who's ever had somebody tell them to get behind, you know, called you Satan and said, get, get in behind, sit. That's basically what he's saying. Okay? Would that damage a friendship? If somebody said that to you. <laughs> Probably would, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, Jesus said that to Peter. And I guess Peter was shaken by it, but something in Peter was really dealt a blow there, wasn't it? Pride. And uh, God knows how to deal with pride. Uh, Jesus knows it's in us, but he still loves us anyway, doesn't he? Uh, we can see this uh, amplified a little bit in Jeremiah 17, verse 9 to 10, where it says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's a sort of a, a rhetorical question there. <laughs> then God goes on to say, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even, given to e I, and, uh, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Amen. So we've got to understand that the natural heart of man, the fallen heart of man, is desperately sick. It's almost beyond understanding. Nobody could figure out the human heart but God. You know, it's a mass of contradictions. It is, it's an enigma. You know, I once heard a, a, it, it described as, you know, our, our human heart and our experience, you know, over a number of years... It's like grabbing the cobwebs off the wall up there, grabbing them down, putting them in your hand, making a ball of it, presenting it and saying, now sort this out. Take it, you know, undo it and put it back into its original form. Uh, for humans, that would be impossible. But for God, it's possible. But we have to understand the enormity of, of what God is doing. Because, you know, sometimes I think when we come in with two little an appreciation of where we've come from, we, have a little, we can't quite appreciate where we're going to. We can't 
fathom the grace that has been provided to us by God. You know, I know I've, I think I had this attitude myself in, in a, a, a milder form, but you know, hey, God, God's lucky he's got me. You know, he picked a good one, but he picked me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Stinking pride. How many have ever encountered that? Or a milder form of it? See, the hook is to say, oh, how many know somebody like that? Because the next question is, how many have ever had those thoughts yourself? Now, I'm just going to wait here. I'll get the musicians up and they can play some sort of mournful music or something while we... Amen. Man's susceptibility to the devil through pride. It was the pride in, that motivated Eve to eat from the tree, wasn't it? It was pride. I mean, you look through the Old Testament, look through the New Testament, you see just pride rising up in so many times that of course it was pride that caused, even before Eve uh, sinned, pride had caused the fall of somebody else from his heavenly place, and that was Satan himself. And so we march down through history and we see pride rising up in people's hearts. David, after a, a number of uh, fantastic victories, decided he was going to count all his soldiers and all the people in his kingdom. God said, no way, David, uh, and stopped him. Even his counselors said, no, David, don't do this, man. They, they probably wouldn't have said, you're in pride and you'll provoke God, but that's exactly what he did. And this plague broke out. Okay, so um, knowing these things then, it's not surprising when we suddenly come face to face with an area of darkness in our life. Okay, so what do we do when we're suddenly confronted by an area of darkness in our, life, in our lives? Oh, I didn't think I could do that. Oh, I've done that. Uh, submit yourself to God. Stop, get quiet, acknowledge it. Um, be specific about it. You know, and, and sometimes that involves getting other people, to, you know, letting other people know too. Uh, do not rationalize sin and failure, but face up to them. This is what we often do when we, we blow it. We rationalize, oh, that's not so big thing. I can get, over, I can get on top of that, etc. But if you feel the Holy Spirit uh, prompting to, you know, to, to go and talk to another person, get prayer for that, I mean, some things are public. You know, lose our rag out in the kitchen. You know, uh, somebody uh, forgot to leave the urn on and the tea's cold. Well, everybody knows that, does You know, there's a scripture, I think, in uh, Philippians, or it might be Timothy, actually. It says, some men's sins go before them to judgment, but others follow afterwards. Meaning that some sins are obvious and they're out there and they're going before you to judgment, but others seem to follow afterwards, the hidden stuff. Amen? But it's the hidden stuff that the devil zeroes in on. Okay, so don't rationalize sin and failure. Uh, face up to them. Acknowledge them. Jesus is the perfect shelter of grace, which, our, uh, you know, which allows us to honestly look at ourselves. We go into his presence, under, into his grace, and then we can have a good look at ourselves. Uh, a protected look at ourselves. When we're under his shelter, even though we're dealing with stuff, the devil can't get to us. He may yell some things from a few things over the fence, but that's not going to worry us. Amen? So realize this too, that God, if God loved you while you were still a sinner, while you were still, still separated from him uh, by sin, and you were just given over to practicing sin, if he still loved you then, how much more will he love you as you seek him? And as you seek his grace to get free from your sin? Amen? Amen? Well, God's love is constant and total, but you know, you're not stepping out of his love. You're actually, you, you're actually, you know, there are levels, while God loves equally, if I can just appease the theologians here, uh, <laughs> Approval isn't the same. 
Amen. God does approve some more than others. We're not all equal under God. And some things we are, but God's approval can vary. God's election, and that's probably another sermon, and calling uh, are conditional on our obedience. We heard this in the uh, offering or communion message. Okay, but, but you know, God, while he loves all his children, and you as parents know this too, amen, there are times, not that we play favourites, but there are times some of your kids can be a lot easier to get along with and you can flow with and work with than some of the others at times. Amen. We love them all, but we're not going to give the keys to our car to every one of them. Or something similar, responsibility. So, yes, there is an approval aspect. And when you go, when you're in trouble, when you've, you know, you've sinned, because that's when you're in trouble, it's not when your emotions are down, but, uh, you know, when you're in trouble, go to God, and that's the place where you find his love. You find it. Okay? It's always there. It's where you find it. Amen. And that's where we learn to fight the devil effectively, from his presence. Amen. I mean, uh, you know, if God's standing with his hand on your shoulder beside you and then you confront the devil from that position, be surprised how quick he runs. Okay. Um, so we must ask ourselves the, the question, are the things that we're fighting today only the harvest that we planted yesterday? You're going through a bit of a bad time, at the, a bit of a trial at the moment. Well, you know, you, in this quiet place, you sit down, well, God, did I sort of contribute to this? Uh, you probably hear a chuckle, yes. Uh, seed that you planted at some time, seed sown to the flesh, will come back and get you. Do not be deceived, it says in Galatians 6 verse 7, God is not mocked. God's, you can't kid God. You can't fool God. Amen? You can try, but you can't. Amen? So God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that he'll reap. So the law of sowing and reaping are immutable, meaning that what you sow will grow. I know, you know that doesn't hold true in gardens and particularly my garden at times, <laughs> but what I sow dies uh, <laughs> through lack and neglect usually. But, but in the spiritual realm, you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh. You sow to the spirit, you'll reap from the spirit. Fact. It's going to happen. You set in a process into, into existence, a process you can't stop. Amen? So good stuff, get good stuff. So bad stuff, some of us think so bad stuff and we get good stuff. Is that logical? No. But that's the logic the, uh, the devil would, would have you try to follow. Okay, so when we sow to the flesh, we're actually uh, fighting against ourselves. How many of you have ever had a budgie? Ever had a budgie? You know what a budgie is? Okay, little bird, okay. Uh, you know, you hang up a mirror in a budgie's cage, what happens? I mean, the budgie goes and he has fun with that mirror, doesn't he? He fights it at first. I mean, if it's a male budgie, he'll attack that mirror and he'll keep doing it for days. Um, and so we are... Are we fighting reflections? You know, sometimes our warfare is against ourselves. Sowing to the flesh, getting all, you know, steamed up when the consequences come in, and, you know, we're actually fighting ourselves. You know, the devil's coming like he's brought a mirror to us, and he's shone it on us, and so we hit that mirror. But, you know, he's not just shining on a, the good things. The mirror he brings to us, if you like, is that, off, you know, he shines, and we can see our fleshy nature in that. We can see the bad stuff, and we fight ourselves. So this is just some, one aspect of the, 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 the battle that we do. So let's have another look at this aspect of, uh, of the battle. Uh, it, 
Matthew 5, verse 25 to 26 says, Matthew 5, make, this is right in, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and it's a rather interesting little script. It says this, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid up the last cent. Okay, let's read it again. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid up the last cent. Okay, so what's Jesus talking about this? The general context is forgiveness, uh, but he, wasn't, he was teaching something, you know, more than just the avoidance of lawsuits. I mean, okay, he was talking about how, you know, we should relate to one another and, and uh, you know, uh, love one another and all that sort of thing, without going into all the, the stuff in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. But, uh, you know, he was actually warning people against, Christians against, or believers against going to, to law with one another. But there was something more than that. You know, often you see in the scriptures, Jesus would speak at one level, but there's often a diff different meaning. He spoke in parables. If you take a parable literally, you, get, you, know, you, you can get into a bit of a twist. There are deeper spiritual meanings throughout the scripture. In fact, uh, he's speaking in such a way as to say that against this opponent and before this particular judge, you will always lose your case and wind up in prison. Um, I believe, among other things, this uh, parable explains God's view of human righteousness. Um, so let's have a quick look. I, I, I believe that the, your opponent at law is the devil. And the judge, of course, is God. Amen? Satan, as our opponent, stands as the accuser of the brethren before God, who is the judge of all. Uh, the truth that we need to see here is that when we approach God on the basis of our own righteousness, our adversary will always have a legal right to condemn us, to demand our imprisonment. And of course our adversary also doubles as our jailer. So we're talking about our opponent at law here is the devil. I remember Isaiah 64 verse 6 talks about our righteousness is as filthy rags. So when we get into that courtroom, when we get into that period of debate uh, where we have committed a crime of some sort, our flesh has popped out and we have sinned, immediately you know, we're sort of like in a courtroom and the devil is there accusing us and hammering at us. And of course, who is the judge? God is. He sits there in the heavenlies. He's already decided for us. But it depends on how we argue our case, is how we come out of that courtroom. Agree quickly with your opponent at law. So there's a strategy. Agree quickly. Now, I don't think Jesus was saying obey the devil. Okay, He's not saying obey the devil here. He just said agree with him doesn't necessarily mean obey. Um, rather, he's saying that when Satan accuses you of some sin or character flaw, if the devil is even remotely right, agree with him. It's to your advantage to not fight the devil uh, when it comes to your own righteousness. Admit it. Who's ever... Well, you've all probably been in that situation where you've done something and then, you know, you've guilt and bad conscience has hammered you for a while and then you've confessed, you've owned up to it and suddenly it feels like a load that's lifted. I have seen so much of that in pastoral ministry over the years where people have struggled and held on to things and you go in there, eventually they come to a point of crisis uh, and, you know... Under the pressure of the Holy Spirit sometimes, under the pressure of the devil, they confess their sin, one to another, get prayer for one another, and what does the, the blood of Jesus do? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
and we get released. The yoke comes off our neck and people get breakthroughs. But you know, what's more, what I have seen, and this is my personal testimony more commonly in, in, in Christendom, is people will hold on and hold on and hold on. Even to the point where their Christian walk is subverted because they won't actually be willing to get that thing out in the open. They're keeping it down there in the devil's larder. That dust that the devil is homing in on. Go on quiet in here. Okay, so if he accuses you of being impure or being cold in your love towards people or not praying enough, etc., etc., well, he's probably right. The key is not to argue with the devil about your righteousness because before God, our own righteousness is unacceptable. It's his filthy rags. No matter how you defend or justify yourself, you know inwardly that there's no substance to this accusation. Uh, and therefore, um, oh, sorry, that... that you can argue, but you know that he's right. There is substance to his accusation. And uh, he's therefore able to bring us under con condemnation. Amen? But if we get the thing that he's aiming at out under the blood, out in the open before God and forgiven, then we stand before him in our own righteousness, uh, in, in Christ's righteousness, the righteousness that's been uh, you know, given to us. We stand before him in Christ. And that's that submitting to God. You cannot submit to God or say we're fully submitted to God when we're holding stuff that we know of down. We're not talking about stuff we don't know of. Amen? In the Old Testament, I think in Numbers 10, it talked about uh, deliberate sin and unintentional sin. And God dealt with it differently. Amen? But when it's intentional, when we're holding stuff that we know is evil, then uh, we, we put ourselves in, in harm's path. We're not submitting ourselves to God. And if we're not submitting ourselves to God, then we are, you know, we're, we're at risk before the devil. Okay. Um, what we need to do is acknowledge uh, that our salvation is not based on what we do, but on... Uh, what Jesus has done. Remember Romans 5 verse 1, having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is our, this is our only defense against the devil. But we must be submitted to God in order for these things to work. Amen? For us to resist the devil, we must submit ourselves to God. In all honesty, Amen. God, you know, God looks at the, the the heart, our hearts. I mean, He wants truth in our innermost being. So if there's a lie or deception there, then we're in trouble. So the more we realise that Jesus alone is unrighteousness, the less we are open to satanic condemnation in the area of our failings. Amen. Uh, a vital key to overcoming the devil then is humility. Uh, to humble ourselves is to refuse to defend our image. Jesus humbled himself. He went to that cross. He didn't defend himself. Um, in your old nature, you're corrupt, desperately sick, but in your born-again nature, you are created in the image of God, of Christ, in Ephesians 2, verse 24. So go ahead. Agree with the devil, your opponent at law, about the condition of your flesh. Say, hey, I'm not surprised in me that dwells no good thing. Uh, except Christ, who dwells in me. And what do you do? You take the wind out of his sails. You know, he loses all impetus. Uh, we see probably in our parliaments at, the, that, at, at a particular time, it's a particularly you know, vivid uh, example of it is when the, the accusations, the counter accusations start flying fast and furious, which they all do. I find I can never listen to question time for more than about two seconds. Uh, um, you know, the accusation is flying and that spirit of accusation is probably as, as intense there as anywhere else in Australia at the moment. Uh, you know, for the guys who fight it, for the people that fight what they need to admit to 
they're the ones who suffer the most. Amen? If you're innocent, well, you know, you can, you can keep your mouth shut and, uh, you know, truth will prevail ultimately. Nothing hidden that won't be revealed. And that's not true of, in Christendom, but it's true of life. Okay, so don't just limit the principle of humbling yourself only to spiritual warfare, but use it in other situations in life as well. The, the power of humility builds a defense around us, a strong defense. And it can stop things, uh, stop us getting into things like strife. Um, uh, things like, you know, getting the whole competitive spirit coming on you. I mean, these are temptations that we face in the workplace. The willingness to get called into some strife. I was driving to work this morning, coming up past Albury High School there, and there's a whole bunch of cyclists all over the road. You know, and I could have thought, oh, I'll force my way past these guys, I'm bigger than them. But I know I probably would have got the car, I would have probably started something. So I just sat there, next thing a guy calls out and they all pull over to one side. And, you know, hi, hi as I go past. You know, <laughs> I could have done the other way. I could have gone the other way where I just pushed my way through them. Um, but then I would have probably had a, you know, I, I would have been courting strife because they all would have had to ride past me as I pulled up in front of the church here. <laughs> yes, more went out the door than uh, would have been a testimony too. Okay, so um, humility can actually, you don't have to force your way ahead in life. You don't have to be the first in the line for everything. Um, competitive spirits and, and the, all sorts of life's irritations can steal our peace. But humility, learning to walk in humility, uh, will keep you back from a lot of that. Okay. Um, and, and God will bless you in that. There's another scripture, this will be my last for the day. Uh, Jeremiah 15 verse 19 uh, says this. Uh, if you return... Okay, he's talking to okay, okay, an Old Testament nation of Israel um, who had got off into all sorts of things. I will restore you. If you return, then I will restore you. Before me you will stand. And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. So God said, look, who is the one who I will use? Who will be my spokesman? The one who separates the precious from the worthless. Or Paul separates, extracts the precious from the worthless. And so we're all, we're, we are presented in our daily lives with uh, a mix. Not everything is totally worthless. Not everything is totally precious. And so we have to make, uh, we have to go through our lives discerning, separating the precious from the worthless. You know, if you look through the, the, the Proverbs at the worthless man, you'll see that they, they are ones who are quick to anger, uh, get into strife quickly, uh, you know, etc., etc. So, you want to be God's spokesman? You want God to use you? Amen? Return to him and then go about this task. It's an ongoing task. Okay. Um, examine... Let me finish with a couple of points here. Uh, carefully, anything that's said about you, okay? Um, when somebody come, brings an accusation or a charge against you, and it doesn't have to be in a court, etc., uh, stop before you answer. Humble yourself, if you like. Just, just, just go quiet. You know, humbling means you don't necessarily come back ready to, you know, um, deal with it. Um, not coming back with a counter-accusation. Um, humbling yourself, and even at some times, it might even be worth your while agreeing with them, especially if there is a modicum of truth in the accusation that they bring to you. Because too often, if I look back on my life and times where I got into the biggest strife and where I probably provoke some of my largest trials in life is when I didn't take this advice, when I fought my corner. 
um, Jesus on trial. Uh, yes, he spoke out on a couple of things, but uh, he didn't. He didn't f try to f fight, defend himself, to the point where Pontius Pilate was was actually unwilling to execute him. Wanted to release him. Wanted to release him, but the devil knows our the weak point, and he was able to find that you know Pontius Pilate held his position uh, with a bit of trepidation. Uh, he, he was careful. He was he always had one eye over his shoulder on Rome, that he was doing the right thing, and that when those Jews came up with that accusation, "You will not be a, a friend, uh, no friend of Caesar," uh, then you know that was the thing. That was the trigger. That was the the point where Pontius Pilate could not actually you know sit on the fence anymore, uh, because there was actually a category. I don't know. I'm going off on a tangent here, but. Um, there was a category of people. There was a, you know, like we have our, those elevated to the peerage or the knighthood or something. They had the Friends of Caesar uh, society, in other words. And if, you were a, um, if you were elected to that, then that was, you know, something very valuable to hold. And so when they came against that, Pontius Pilate then uh, had to pursue his own interests. And so... You're in a situation, you're on trial. If you come out and fight your corner, then you make things worse. Here's the thing, if you can't agree, uh, wait, okay, so um, humble yourself and agree with them, but if you can't agree, don't fight your corner. Don't be too quick to defend yourself. Amen, now there are, you know, um, this is as, as a general rule. There, there, there may come exceptions. But if you remain humble in heart, God will give you grace. Uh, and Satan will be forced to flee. You humble yourself, God will turn up on your scene. Satan will be, reforced, be forced to flee. And suddenly that impossible situation that you were in, uh, you know, where you're facing jail or, or worse, God can just turn that around. You get the devil off the scene. It's amazing how the most horrendous situations can turn out. Whether it be an illness, whether it be you know, some bankruptcy, financial thing, whether it be you know, accusations of any sort. You humble yourself before God, God can turn the situation around. And the first thing that you need to, to, to see happen is get the devil out of there, fleeing away from your life. But you stay there fighting, you stay there coming from the flesh, well, guess what? You know, petrol on the fire. Hallelujah. Remember, Satan hates godliness and humility because humility is the surrender of the soul to the Lord. And Satan will always flee from the presence of the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for these reminders. Uh, Father, we're living in a society that is uh, becoming more fleshly. Uh, Father, the flesh is parading itself as, as, as holy and righteous. Father, we're living in a day where the unrighteous are shaking their, uh, their fists in your very face. And Lord, I guess for those that are discerning and see from the scripture, Father, events are working together, uh, Father, to create a situation where, Lord, you, you, it's almost like you couldn't remain uh, in heaven without uh, entering this, this realm uh, in judgment. Father, you've chose to withhold judgment for a season, but it was only ever for a season. Father, when we remember the future, when we look at the prophetic word in the scriptures, Father, we see that uh, you are, Jesus is returning. And Father, he will scatter, he will destroy all the unrighteous with the light of his presence. The light of his presence, Father. He won't have to go in and arbitrate in little battles. Father, that light will scatter all darkness. And Satan won't be within light years of the place.
bound even under the light, a light that even he can't withstand. So Lord, we see these things coming. What sort of people should we be in the interim? Well, Father, you've called us to be your children, to love you, to come, to sit at your feet, to humble ourselves, to submit ourselves to you.